so we are at Christianity, and the name of the course, of course, is Christianity versus World Religions, and uh, this is lesson number two. We had the introductory lesson last week, and that was uh, uh, about um, unorganized religions in the world. Now we're going to move to organized religions in the world. We're going to compare Christianity uh, to uh, Judaism. Now I mentioned last week that uh, there were 12 major religions, uh, 12 if you count all the primitive religions in that group. Uh, the balance of our course will deal of course with the remaining 11 major organized religion. So there's 11 organized religions uh, in the world and there's one kind of you know, uh, group of unorganized religions. We looked at that last week. We'll uh, be using uh, the uh, comparative method for our study, which means that we'll be looking at the same categories for each religion and seeing how they compare to each other. That's why I said it was important that you have these handouts because uh, you'll have the, uh, uh, the section on Christianity filled out. We're going to do that tonight. And then you can you know, compare that to all the other ones that we will do from week to week. Uh, as I say, I've prepared a worksheet for these, uh, for those rather who'd like to take notes or find an easier way to follow along. Uh, use the boxes in each of the categories to put in the information from the lesson. And then you put the name of the religion we happen to be working on at the top. Hopefully at the end of the course, you'll have a uh, pretty good set of notes and a way to compare the major elements of each religion to one another. Today, we're going to look at the basis for all comparison, and that is the religion of Christianity. It's the base. We're going to use this one to compare it to all the others. Now, normally, the study of different world religions compares them to each other element by element and tries not to make any judgment calls. Okay. Of course, we're not going to follow this particular strategy. We're going to look at all the elements of each religion, but we will purposefully compare them to the Christian religion to, to notice if one is superior to another, if one uh, is more effective uh, than another. And that's the point of this uh, particular course. So let's put down the basic elements of the Christian religion first, and then we're going to use this as a comparison to all the others that we will study. Uh, as I said, we're going to use our information sheets to do this. So Christianity uh, would, uh, the way I'm going to do it tonight, this is how Christianity would be explained if uh, we were taking a comparative religion course in a school, at a college somewhere, all right? Uh, and this first one here will be the most familiar to you. Uh, but this is the way and this is the approach that most teachers take to teach uh, comparative religion. All right, here we go. So we're going to talk about Christianity and uh, the various uh, categories that we've already talked about. Uh, founders, origins, deity, mankind, salvation, cultus, scriptures, geography, and miscellaneous facts. Those are the categories that we will fill in for the religion of Christianity. And then we will fill in the same categories for the other religions as we go on from week to week. So we begin with Christianity, the founder. Well, the founder of Christianity, Jesus, son of Joseph of Nazareth, called the Christ. He was a Jew in the first century. He claimed to be the divine son of God and savior of the world. He was put on trial by Jews for that particular claim and then executed by Romans as a political favor to the Jewish leadership. Jesus claimed that his death and resurrection from the dead was predicted in the Jewish scriptures and when accomplished would verify and confirm his claims to be the Messiah. Origins of Christianity. Well, you have different levels, uh, different periods, if you wish, of Christianity. You have ancient Christianity from about 30 AD to 467 AD. That's ancient Christianity. During this period, you have the spread of apostolic Christianity culminating in the Christian religion becoming 
the religion of the empire. Uh, the collapse of the Roman Empire gave rise to the social and spiritual leadership uh, by religious leaders in Rome. And this began the emergence of the Roman Catholic Church, this brand, if you wish, this type of Christianity. Rome was the largest city at that time, the largest population, and of course it had the largest church and that particular church had the most influence. And because of that, it began to dominate and control uh, Christianity as a whole. Next would be medieval Christianity from 476 to 1517. The middle years, medieval means the middle years. Uh, the consolidation of religious authority and domination by the Roman Catholic Church occurred during this uh, period of time. Uh, secularization of the Roman Catholic Church and leaders uh, began. Uh, the church became very political at that time. Uh, a king could not rise to the throne without the approval uh, of the Pope uh, in Rome. And so the Roman church had tremendous uh, political authority at that time. Uh, the Renaissance, uh, beginning with the Italian Renaissance, was a reaction against the dominion and the dominance of the Roman Catholic Church and this repressive universalism that was taking place throughout Europe. Uh, the church uh, became a political power broker in Europe and many artists and writers began to create pieces of art that you know, pushed back Against this, uh, against this dominance. After medieval Christianity, you have what's called modern Christianity, 1517 to 1960, uh, beginning with Luther's 95 thesis, Martin Luther in 1517, uh, kicking off, if you wish, the Protestant uh, revolution, Protestant movement, and within the Protestant movement, you had the fragmentation of religious uh, groups. The restoration movement, for example, is part of that, comes out of the Reformation. The idea here in modern Christianity was that individuals had the responsibility for finding and expressing the truth of the Bible. This responsibility did not expressly reside only in the church, okay? And so this idea influenced um, uh, much of uh, the religious world at the time, and it also influenced a lot of modern democratic thought. So there were many you know, effects of uh, the uh, uh, Protestant uh, Reformation, not only in religion, but in politics as well. And then you have what's called postmodern Christianity, 1960 to the present. Churches moving away from Bible authority, the idea that all things are relative, uh, that all religions are equal, uh, kind of summarizes the thinking of postmodern Christianity. One religion is as good as another, uh, is where we kind of are at at this uh, particular time. Uh, in, uh, in history as far as Christianity is concerned. Another category is the concept of deity within Christianity. The idea, uh, the major idea in Christianity is that God is one and yet has diversity. For example, he's the creator and the sustainer and the judge. Uh, and uh, the individual uh, that or, or the uh, deity that does this is the father. Then you have the son who is the prophet, the priest, the king and the savior. And then you have the Holy Spirit who is the intercessor and the witness and the revealer. So within Christianity, you have, you have a very dynamic concept of who and what exactly uh, God is. Uh, he is all encompassing, he's eternal. Uh, uh, Christians believe in monotheism, a dynamic monotheism, uh, also exclusive, personal, and intimate. All, of wor all words that would uh, easily um, describe uh, the God of uh, Christianity. Uh, 
Christianity's concept of mankind is that man is created in the image of God, essentially good, has free will, and uh, the world was created uh, in order to sustain mankind. Uh, in Christianity, the thinking is, the teaching is that man um, has fallen he, because of free will, he has free will, has chosen sin, has chosen disobedience, therefore mankind has fallen through moral failure and needs restoration. There is a need for salvation. Uh, this is the concept of man and where man is at, if you wish, as far as Christians are concerned. The idea of salvation in Christianity, man's guilt separates him from God and does so eternally. God therefore takes on humanity and offers his perfect human life as a payment for the sins of all mankind. And this person, this human divine person is Jesus Christ. Therefore mankind is then reunited to God through faith in Jesus Christ. And that basically is the idea of salvation uh, within uh, Christianity. The cultus, if you wish, the types of worship uh, in Christianity, faith in Christianity is expressed through various rituals, uh, one through repentance and baptism. Faith is expressed in that way primarily at the beginning in order to become a Christian. And uh, the pursuit of right living is another way of uh, expressing one's uh, Christian faith. There's also a public gathering for a commemorative meal called the communion or the Lord's Supper, uh, at which time there are prayers offered and teaching, uh, a fellowship of believers, uh, service sharing, uh, various activities. The uh, scriptures within Christianity, the Bible, uh, that contains both the Old and the New Testament. Uh, in Christianity, uh, there is the belief that uh, these writings are directly inspired by God and have been recorded and preserved by man according to and with the help of the Holy Spirit. Geography. Well, geography for Christianity is uh, fairly simple began in Israel, but has spread throughout the world. The greatest concentration of Christians are in the United States, Europe, South America, and recently Africa. Uh, and the country of Africa is very quickly becoming the dominant center of Christianity in the modern world. It wasn't always, there was a time it was Europe, and then it was the United States, now Africa, is becoming the uh, dominant center of Christianity as far as converts are concerned and the number of individuals that practice the faith. And then some miscellaneous, uh, some miscellaneous information about Christianity. You have a specific clergy within Christianity, uh, individuals that are specifically trained, if you wish, to conduct worship services and other practices. Uh, this religion is evangelistic in nature. In other words, uh, meaning tries to convince others to come into this uh, religion. It is revelational. In other words, the information in Christianity has not simply come through the agency of human beings, but it has been revealed to human beings uh, by God through various ways through prophets and different things. There are many different groups within uh, Christianity, all claiming to be part of the Christian faith. And there is the belief that Jesus will inaugurate the end of the world at his second coming. Uh, and at the second coming uh, will be the beginning of, uh, of eternity, where the faithful will be with God and the unfaithful, the non-believers, the sinners uh, will be punished in hell. So this is, uh, this is how Christianity would be categorized if it, if it was looked at through the eyes of a person studying comparative religion. If you were at uh, Rose State or at some you know, community college and you took a typical course in comparative religion, 
what I've done here with Christianity is pretty much how the teacher would be teaching Christianity. Would be trying to do it objectively, simply giving you the facts about this particular religion. All right, we're going to move on to another religion. We're going to compare Christianity uh, to this religion. And here's where the comparison comes in because we're going to use the same categories, but this time we're going to switch the religion. This time we're going to look at Judaism. We're going to do the same categories. All right, so Judaism is one of the four religious uh, or religions that are grouped in the what's called the Near Eastern section. And the reason merely is geographical. All of these religions started in, in the same geographical uh, area. Um, had the Jews accepted Jesus Christ as their Messiah, these two religions, Christianity and Judaism, uh, would not be separate, but would rather form a single unit, one merely completing the, uh, the other. The claim of Jesus and the apostles, however, was that the whole purpose of the Jewish history, uh, the Jewish religion, the Jewish society, the purpose of all of this was to provide a historical stage upon which the Christ could make an appearance in this world. This is the, this is the view uh, that Christians have of Judaism. It doesn't deny that it is a legitimate religion. It is a religion that was capped off at a certain point, unfulfilled if you wish. So the purpose of the religion was to provide an entry for the Christ to come onto this world. The Jews, however, rejected this claim and their Messiah as well. And so, as I say, they kind of capped off their religion at this point. Uh, it, makes me give, it makes me think of an example, you know, this capping off of their religion. I remember back in, when I was in junior high, uh, across the street from my school, there was a cathedral, a Catholic cathedral. Uh, that they began to build and they dug deep, you know, because there was a basement and there, there was the foundation. It was huge, you know, there was the foundation. And then the congregation ran out of money. They, they couldn't, you know, build the walls and build, you know, the cathedral. So what they decided to do was simply cap off the basement. And so they put a tin roof, you know, on the basement, put in electrical, and they had just a basement. They had a big room down there and they said mass and did everything, you know, uh, that they needed to do, but they did it in this kind of, you know, incomplete uh, church building. Um, the building originally designed was meant to have spires, you know, and a big cross and a bell tower but it was cut off at a certain point and it was finished before the plan for it was complete. So we study Judaism as a major organized religion as it is now and not as what it was meant to be. It was meant to be more than what it is now, but much like that cathedral that was capped off because they ran out of money, with well, Judaism was capped off at a certain point because it ran out of it ran out of faith. It, it did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah that God had promised that would come through these people. So let's take a look at the, the founders and origins. Uh, Jews see their history differently than we see it. We see it as one unbroken thread, you know, from Abraham until now. They see their history in stages. First, there's what's called biblical Judaism from 1400 BC to 200 BC. So you have Abraham and Moses and the prophets and the kings and statehood and all of that. And all of the, all of the information that is recorded in the Old Testament. All of this is what is referred to as biblical Judaism. Then you have rabbinic Judaism, 220 BC to 425 AD. It is called rabbinic Judaism because the authority in religion for this period of time was the rabbi. There were no prophets left. God did, sent no prophets. After John the Baptist, he was the last of the prophets. 
And so the rabbis took control of the teaching. They became the authority. And we see this in Jesus' constant conflict with the rabbis and the Pharisees. And so the type of uh, Judaism practiced from, as I say, 220 BC to 425 AD, rabbinic Judaism. And then you have European Judaism from 425 AD to 1800 AD. Now the majority of Jews lived in Europe, not in, not in Israel, uh, many of them in Spain, as a matter of fact. Um, the Islamic influence had dispersed them and there was constant struggle with the Roman Catholic Church and the Jewish community. Uh, they were targets of oppression and intolerance. Now, since they were not allowed to own any property, that was a, a universal law, they, they were not allowed to own any type of property, they survived by developing skills in commerce, medicine, law, shipping, and banking, among other things. That's why you always wonder, how come you know, Jewish people, they seem to be really good at business, or there are a lot of doctors who are Jewish, and so on and so forth. Well, some of it is because uh, they have such a long history in these, uh, in these uh, 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 types of uh, endeavors. Uh, I, I remember uh, visiting Israel and um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the person that uh, brought us around, the tour guide, who was a Jewish person who lived in Israel, he took us to a diamond factory uh, where they cut diamonds. And he explained that diamond processing was the second, uh, third rather, the third most important industry in Israel. And uh, we wondered why such a small country had so many diamond cutters. Well, it was because uh, during the, um, uh, you know, during the uh, 20th century, early 20th century, uh, most of the good diamond cutters and diamond processors were Jewish uh, throughout Europe. And after World War I and World War II, the Jews were displaced and they became refugees. They had no country that would take them. And after the war, they were eventually repatriated to what is now Israel. It was Israel and it once again became Israel. Well, what happened is that the majority of the best diamond cutters in the world found themselves all in Israel. And so they did what they, you know, what they were trained to do. And you have many, many factories. As a matter of fact, the majority of the world's diamonds are cut and processed uh, in, in, in Israel. Then uh, uh, since the 1800s, moving on here, since the 1800s, there have been three main groups with modern Judaism from 1800 uh, to now. You have, um, uh, let me give you a slide of it. There you go, modern Judaism. From 1800 today, you have Reform Judaism. Reform Judaism is the liberal branch uh, who try to reconcile their beliefs to modern science and society. So they're liberal in their religious thinking. It was through the efforts of this group that the modern state of Israel was uh, reestablished after uh, World War II. Uh, the next group are, are the conservative uh, Jews, conservative Judaism. They hold to the old ways of Judaism, although they don't offer animal sacrifices. They still hold to the concept of the Messiah and a personal savior, conservative Judaism. And then you have Orthodox uh, Judaism, they're the most conservative of the uh, Jewish uh, uh, groups. They hold to everything except animal sacrifice. And the reason they don't do animal sacrifice, uh, two things. One, there's no temple in which to offer sacrifice. And two, no priesthood to offer sacrifice. And there's no priesthood uh, because the records, uh, the genealogical records uh, of the Jews uh, to determine you know, who belonged to which tribe and which family. These were destroyed in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed the uh, Jewish temple. They also destroyed all the ge genealogical records uh, where someone could prove from which tribe they came, specifically if they came from the tribe of Levi and you know, came from a priestly, priestly tribe. 
The Orthodox Jews, of course, are the individuals that wear the long hair and they dress uh, you know, in black. Uh, and many times they hold the balance of political power uh, in, um, in uh, Israel. Uh, they are, uh, some consider them the modern day uh, Pharisees. Uh, their concept of deity for Judaism, God is one, Yahweh, uh, and God is not dynamic. They don't hold to the dynamism of the Godhead as Christians do. Uh, God has revealed himself through the prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, he is pure spirit, eternal, just, compassionate. As far as Jesus is concerned, Jesus was only a man, uh, a good man, perhaps a rabbi, a, a wise rabbi, but no more than, than this. They're thinking on mankind created by God, has a soul, will die only once, uh, subject to sin. Uh, and the greatest man was Moses. Moses was the greatest, greatest teacher. Uh, the person held in highest esteem by, the, by Judaism um, is Moses. Their concept of salvation Transgression against God's law is sin and means separation from God. And keeping God's laws leads to salvation. No need for a sin sacrifice on their behalf. I actually had a Jewish woman tell me that one day, we were just talking, exchanging ideas about religion. And she says, I don't understand you people, you need this sacrifice for sin. I don't need a sacrifice for sin. Nobody needs to die for my sins. And I asked her why? And she says, because I don't have any. And I said, you don't have any? She said, no, she said, because I, I keep the law. So I said, okay, I didn't want to go into a big debate about, about that, but it was surprising to hear her answer. Uh, uh, many Jews uh, believe that the Jewish nation itself is the Messiah, okay? They believe that the Jewish nation itself is the Messiah and God's choice of them is their guarantee of salvation. And if they keep his laws, which range from moral to ceremonial laws, depending on the group, you are saved and you are going to be uh, with God. The whole idea is that uh, being Jewish is what saves you. If you're Jewish, that's the thing that saves you. I suppose that's what the, that lady meant. You know, I don't need somebody to die for me. I'm already saved. I'm, I'm Jewish. Now, what's wrong with this idea? You, you don't have to go to the New Testament to demonstrate what is wrong with that idea that just being Jewish is what saves you. In the Old Testament, it's very clear. It says, first of all, that God is not partial. Leviticus chapter 24. In other words, he's not partial for one group or another group. So just being part of a cultural group is, you know, does not have the power to save you. In Psalm 14, uh, one to three, uh, 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 David says that all have sinned. No one can keep the law. 14 verses one to three. So this business of all, oh, well, I keep the law, that's why I'm saved, you know. Even in the Old Testament, there was a recognition that no one could keep the law. And then of course, there is a resurrection in Psalm 49 verse 15. The idea of resurrection, not as well developed in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. As far as cultus is uh, concerned, uh, the main temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. Of course, we know that in 70 AD. Um, but uh, today uh, synagogues are used for assembly, for prayer, for singing, reading. Uh, and synagogues didn't always exist. If you read the Old Testament, you, you, they never talk about synagogues. They only talk about synagogues in the New Testament. Synagogues uh, began when the Jews were in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. They couldn't go to the temple, obviously, because the Babylonians had destroyed their uh, temple. And so they began to meet in homes and have prayer and read uh, the uh, 
the scriptures uh, and share and teach one another in homes. And then eventually they built you know, meeting places and called them synagogues, uh, which means house of prayer. And so this synagogue movement began actually in Babylon out of necessity. When the temple was rebuilt, when they were uh, repatriated back to uh, Israel uh, to build up the temple uh, once again so that they could offer sacrifice and do all of that, they also began and continued to build synagogues uh, in the various cities uh, around uh, Jerusalem. And so the idea of the synagogue for assembly and prayer and teaching stayed on after the Babylonian captivity and has continued on to uh, this day. Uh, the largest uh, synagogue in the world uh, is uh, Belts, uh, called the Belts. Uh, it's in Jerusalem, uh, seats uh, you know, uh, 6,000 uh, people. Um, they, um, in the synagogues, the Jewish people follow the Jewish festivals and holy days, depending on which group you're in. So if you're in the liberal group, not so much. If you're in the Orthodox group, you follow all the, you know, all the various uh, rituals. Uh, the Feast of Booths, uh, for example, where uh, Jews live in a kind of a tent, if you wish, uh, to remind them of when they lived uh, you know, out in the in tents uh, while they wandered in the desert. Uh, you go to Manhattan or you go to different uh, places where many Jews live in, in cities and uh, out on their porches, uh, they've built these booths you know, during the, that festival. So many uh, Jewish people continue to uh, uh, observe the festivals written about in the Old Testament. Their scriptures, of course, the Torah, which means to teach, is the Hebrew Bible. It contains uh, written laws and revelation, which is what we call the Old Testament. It also has, in addition to those, oral teachings and traditions and commentaries by various rabbis and teachers, uh, uh, different books, the Talmud, the Midrash, and the Mishnah. Uh, the Jews don't consider their writings as the Old Testament. And of course, they reject the New Testament as having no authority whatsoever. Uh, when we speak to a Jewish person and we refer to their scriptures, we talk about the, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, if you wish to not be offensive in speaking to a devout Jew and you're speaking about their scriptures, you, you refer to it as the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. Uh, geography, uh, well, same as Christianity, began in Israel, uh, worked its way through Europe, and now it is worldwide. I want to say something about the term Palestine, because a lot of people, you know, they, they refer to Israel as Palestine, and they say, oh, it was always Palestine. And I want to clarify this idea. The term Palestine was first used in 500 BC by the Greek historian uh, Herodotus. Uh, it was brought into common usage only in the second century, okay, AD. And it was uh, used by the Romans in order to minimize Jewish identification with that land. And that was for political purposes. So the, the Romans began to refer to Israel as Palestine. And Palestine is, has a root word having to do with one of the ancient peoples that lived in the area, the Philistines. And so uh, the Philistines lived in uh, the uh, West Bank uh, area, uh, modern West Bank area, and uh, the name derives from an ancient uh, construction of a term for people that lived in that area. So when you're talking about Palestine, you're talking about the land of Israel, but it was a name given to it uh, by the Romans and not a name that the Jews themselves uh, gave to it. They never referred to themselves as uh, Palestinians. And then uh, uh, a couple of miscellaneous things. Uh, Theodore Herzl began uh, what's called the Zionist movement in 1863 uh, as part of reform Judaism. 
And this ultimately led to the reestablishment of modern Israel. So when you hear about Zionism and he's a Zionist, you know, what does that mean? It means the reestablishment of the ancient country of Israel in the modern times, all right? Zion, many times referring to the city of Jerusalem. Uh, Jews believe that their presence is a blessing and they believe that through them, God blesses mankind and their nation will be the instrument uh, of world salvation. And that is the reason for their suffering. They put all of their suffering throughout history and they have suffered considerably uh, into context by saying that they, remember I said before, uh, many Jews believe that the Jewish nation is the Messiah. And they're saying that the suffering that they've suffered as a nation is the suffering of uh, the Messiah on behalf of the world. Um, and that God eventually will bless the world through uh, Judaism. Uh, many politicians believe this, and this is why there's such a deference in the United States uh, to Israel, especially premillennial believers uh, see the Jews as you know, a people that, that God will eventually use to bless uh, the world. And so uh, that religious thinking has kind of ble you know, bled over into political thinking. Uh, as far as uh, a more realistic, uh, you know, uh, a more realistic uh, thought, and that is that uh, Israel is also a nation uh, uh, one of the only uh, friendly nations to the United States in that region. And it also uh, has uh, nuclear weapons. And I would think that's more of a reason for the uh, relationship between the United States and Israel, at least at, in this point, point of history. Okay, so there you go. There's, a, there's a, a, just a thumbnail sketch of a religion. If you're watching and you're a Jewish person, Please don't be offended, I didn't talk about this or I didn't go into detail about that. The whole point here is just to give a sampling, if you wish, of each religion so that they can be compared uh, one to another. All right, uh, next time uh, that we get together, we're going to do two more religions uh, in the Near Eastern group, and that's Zoroastrianism and Islam. We're going to talk about those and we're going to you know, kind of put those next to Christianity. Remember, you know, the sheets that I was talking about, they're online, they're uh, on our website, bibletalk.tv. Just go to Christianity versus world religions, uh, scan down to lesson two, and right there, all of the material is there that you'll need and just, you know, hit the button and print out a sheet and uh, use that for the next lesson. I think that's it for now. Thank you very much for your attention and we will see you next time, either online or in person.